Hello, welcome to another episode of A Spot of Science. I'm Gus. I'm Chris. And I'm Sally. And this week's episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Not all ingredients are created equal. Fresh, high-quality ingredients make a real difference, so it's important to know where your food comes from. For less than $10 per person per meal, Blue Apron delivers seasonal recipes along with pre-portioned ingredients to make delicious home-cooked meals. Choose from a variety of new recipes each week, or let Blue Apron's culinary team surprise you. Recipes are not repeated within a year, so you'll never get bored. Blue Apron's freshness guarantee promises that every ingredient in your delivery arrives ready to cook or they'll make it right. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash bite size. You'll love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. That's blueapron.com slash bite size. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. You guys ready for some more spots of science? Always science spots? ready. We need like a... For the show, like a, a theme, like a slit spot at si- or, you know, like a yell, a rally cry. A rally cry. Yeah. It's for science. Yeah. There you go. Science? Well, it's just for science. Well, already uh, yeah. viewers can submit questions to sciencespotevereseeth.com. Maybe yeah. they can submit uh, a rally a rally cry for us as well. So get on that. All right. Here we go. Got a quick little question for you, Chris, as always. Mm-hmm. I'll let you get first pass. So I am sitting outside in the cold. And can see me breath, I think <laughs> I meant my breath, uh, as well as the smoke from my cigarette. And I was wondering, if it were hot enough, would you not be able to see the smoke from the cigarette? Sincerely, Rosen Sia, Rosen Xia. Yeah, this one's this one I think is kind of dumb. <laughs> oh! Oh, oh bad. Because it's, it's entirely two different processes, right? So when you, when you breathe out your hot air into the cold sky, it's, it's the moisture from your breath freezing up not freezing up but like condensating condensating is that the right word condensing Con- yeah and so that's what's happening it's turning into like fog okay essentially. smoke is just the the chemicals burning and creating it's a it's a chemical reaction and that's the byproduct which i guess it's not a chem- is it a chemical reaction whenever water changes so it's no, no that's a physical reaction that's a physical reaction right so they're two completely different processes and um so no, he might burn though. Maybe he should get in the, he should get in the oven and start smoking cigarettes and see what happens. Well, well, Sally, spot on. My work here is done. I have trained yeah. you as much as I can. Look at you, even differentiating between chemical reactions and physical reactions. Yeah, proud of you. No, that is yeah, spot on. Water vapor. I mean, there's smoke contains water vapor as well. Um, so you might see more of it in um, colder temperatures. But yeah, it's opaque particles in smoke, so that will never disappear. Mm. You can apparently make fog or like th- that kind of dragon's breath thing even without the cold i've watched youtube videos on this but have failed to be able to do this so i'm going to see if one of you two can do it so okay what you got to do is taking a big breath and then do with your tongue inside your mouth with your mouth shut that heats up your mouth and creates tiny little um, spritzes of water that then can evaporate more. So you're trying to increase the humidity in your air. And with then, your mouth closed. But with your mouth closed. And then all within the same breath, you got to, so blow out, but not actually blow out. So you're increasing the pressure and higher pressure gross. increases the temperature inside your mouth with PV equals NRT, uh, the ideal uh, gas equation. And so that, so high temperatures, high pressures, this all increases the uh, ability of air to hold moisture. So then when you go at the end of it, you're supposed to be able to see it. Make so, sure you uh, pressurize it. See if this. <laughs> so just push out and then very slowly blow out. <laughs> not work. quite so slowly <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i i can't do it i've tried this um but i was so yeah I, I i don't know if that's a thing. okay well well chris you'll have to try that keep trying that in yeah. your off time we have, yes. we, have yeah. we have uh more everyone more at home can here. try that in some videos more if it works. is at science spot at roosterteeth.com yeah. um we have a question here from michael that asks why is terminal velocity a thing chris before we, of course, get to why terminal velocity is a thing, Chris, do you want to explain for the layperson what terminal velocity well, is? Well, I have, I'm not, you know, there's a couple of theories. Oh, we have a video it. demonstrating it here. Okay. They do, I will let you watch the video and see. So it looks like we have some, uh, some people with parachutes who jumped out of a plane. Skydivers, there you go, the word escaped me. And uh, they're falling. So, term, speed at which the force. Oh, shit. Uh, 
There you go. Because, <laughs> man, I, I was going to... My thought was it's like terminal velocity... Init- at first, I had no idea. I was like, is that the, is that the speed that at movie? which... Oh. The speed at which you die? <laughs> 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 like, are you going so fast that your body like rips you apart without being any sort of cover? Right. Like, That's what people used to think would happen if you got on a train. Exactly. But then I was thinking, like, oh, well, that would also depend on how high up you are because the the, the um, you know air has different consistency depending on the altitude. So your terminal velocity would – does it vary the higher up you are than the lower you are? Because what it actually is – The thing that doesn't exist, does it vary? No. <laughs> <laughs> like <you're, you're> <laughs> <laughs> okay. Then going back from that, um, and then I realized whenever I heard people talking about parachuting – before we started filming, I was like, oh yeah, terminal velocity is the speed, is like the fastest you can fall and you kind of hit like a speed where you're just not, you're not going to go any faster. You're just like, because you, you fall a certain length and you start speeding up, you're speeding up, speeding up, and then you just even out. What mm-hmm. makes you speed up? I feel uh, like a teacher. Gravity. Now. Yeah. What is acceleration due to gravity? What is the number? Do you know? No. 9.8 meters Nine, per second squared. 9.8 meters, yeah. So for every second, your speed will increase by 9.8 meters per second. And then at a certain point, you even out. Why? Because you're speeding up to a certain place, and then but you, because your body is a certain length, and and your your the weight, the air pushing against your body is like has resistance, and there's only and, or drag, and, but yeah. Yeah. So there's enough resistance in the air to equalize. The speed, so it evens out, and it reaches. Terminal so then, velocity. can you reach different terminal velocities? So, like, if you're on your stomach, there's more surface area to create drag, whereas if you like narrow down and just had your feet, it's less surface area. So yeah, you go a little faster. So that's why there are those ridiculous people called base jumpers who literally just jump off buildings without parachutes. They have webbing material between their feet and their hands, like flying squirrels, flying foxes, flying frogs, flying lizards, flying snakes. They will all increase their surface area because so you've got the force of gravity pulling you down. You've got drag, which is a force um, due to air resistance. Once those forces equalize, acceleration requires um, unbalanced forces. So once those forces are balanced, you can no longer accelerate. And so for humans, it's 120 miles per hour is our terminal velocity. And if you are unprotected, then yeah, your skin will start to fall off. Oh, really? It, it's, it's rid- you do not want to be falling that fast um, without some kind of protection. Because it'll rip your skin off. Kind of, yeah. Um, and, and yeah, so the air resistance will change depending on where you're falling. If you're falling through a vacuum, so there is no air resistance, there is no terminal velocity. You will just You will keep continue falling. accelerating. You'll get faster and faster and faster and faster and never stop getting faster. That would be an amazing visual to see someone fall from a, a, a vacuum from space and see how fast they got and then just watch them splatter. Well, it's, well when essentially, when things are in orbit, they're falling towards Earth but missing. Yes. So that's, like, that's why they're going so but fast. But when a shuttle re-enters the Earth's atmosphere, mm. you see it heating up. That is friction? the air pushing up against it. It's yeah. the friction of the air. Yeah. Heating up. Heating up. Wow. I've got a question for you. Why is it, this is such a misleading question, that when you open your parachute, so you've got someone falling, someone falling, they open their parachute, what happens to them? Uh, they increase their, their drag a lot. But it, as you're watching a video of someone falling on a parachute, it looks like they go whoosh and they go back up in the air. Why do they... Why do they go up? Yeah. Well, they don't go up. Just everyone else keeps going down. Yeah. Look at you, Chris. Loads of people don't realize that. Lots of people think when you open your parachute that there's something pushing you up. But it's just the guy filming you hasn't opened his parachute yet. And so it always looks as if you've shot up. But actually, it's the camera person has gone down and you've stopped moving down as fast. That'd be a really cool parachute, though, if you could somehow design a parachute that did shoot you back up. Like a rocket. That's got a that would rocket, pack. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a jetpack. Yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> no correct, one is denying Chris. that jetpacks would be cool. Chris had a question that he wanted to contribute here to the discussion. What would happen if you start eating human brains? Could brains. there be yeah? Could there be any negative effects or positive effects um, by eating other brains? And also, broadly speaking, like, what if you just 
that didn't work out. So you just start eating like uh like other DNA things like testicle, human testicles, because that like mix your your. Do you just mean cannibalism in general, Chris? Well, but I think specifically things that are like brain. So you're talking or, about things with DNA, or you're talking about brains? Well, let's do brains first. Okay. Brains, now this is really interesting because actually it's a terrible idea to never eat human brains. Because, so you know how there are diseases, yeah? And they can be caused by a virus or a bacteria or a fungus. There are these weird diseases caused by things called prions. And these are misfolded proteins. So imagine a protein like a string of beads and then you screw it all up into a particular shape. That's it's a proteins are always folded, but they can be misfolded in the wrong shape. Mm -hmm. What's really weird is that if one normal folded protein comes into contact with a misfolded protein, it causes the normal one to misfold. It's a bad influence on them. Exactly. And so these prion diseases, you can eat them and then it changes you. Like, it doesn't have to be alive. This is the thing. Proteins aren't living. They're just chemicals. And so this was the big problem with mad cow disease in the UK. That was a prion disease. And the human equivalent is Crooksfeld Yachelt disease. Um, is that CJD? CJD. Yeah. And this is caused by eating the spine and the nervous system of other mammals. So uh, bovine uh, spongy form encephalopathy. P V S E, that's mad cow disease. Um, that was when we ate uh so cows would eat other cow brain tissue because a lot of um cheap animal food just contains the off parts, uh, the offcuts of meat that aren't used in the meat industry because to add to their protein. But if you feed them neural material that can contain the prions, you can't just get rid of it that easily. They would eat it and that would cause their own proteins to misfold. And then they get these terrible brain diseases. And so now, I mean, this was a huge thing in the UK to the point where no European trusts British beef anymore. It used to be British beef was the best beef in Europe and now no one will touch it with a barge pole, even though we've not had mad cow disease for years. Isn't it also very difficult to detect until like posthumously? Uh, I don't think so. Um, I don't remember because I think it mostly happened in the 80s. Um, but... Now there are so many laws to make sure that cattle don't eat other cattle or other any other animal products. I actually worked in a lab where they would randomly spot check feed coming into ports in the UK, grind up, look it under the microscope and see if you could find any bones, any muscle tissue. They were only allowed to eat plant material. I, I see there's a new test here that's 100% accurate, blood test for it. So, oh, yeah. so um this is only for species to species, right? So, so it can cross species. It can be cross well. species. Yeah, like she's mentioned, like it would happen to humans who were eating, eating yeah. mad yeah. cows. So um, the it depends on the particular prion, but because we share so many proteins in common between mammals, if you have one protein, it can also affect you. Yeah. Yeah. So and that so you just don't eat brains. Don't, eat, don't ever eat, don't brains, eat brains, pretty much. Do and it's more likely to happen within a species. I mean, it will happy, happen between species, but it's even more likely to happen within a species. Is it more specific to brains or just like any other body part? Like, I brains... don't know why it is the brain. I mean, so these the prion diseases that we know about have happened in the brain and the spinal cord. I don't know if there's a reason why those particular organs are are more likely to happen. It might be just to do with the fact that if there is some misfolding in the brain, the brain is such a sensitive organ that that causes catastrophic failure. I wonder if, you know, if there were any cannibal societies in the past who knew not to eat brains. Quite possibly. I, I don't know about cannibalism, but um, Inuits and Eskimos, people that live in the polar regions, they never eat the liver of the seals that they eat because then they'll get vitamin A overdosing, which is toxic. It's um, reractane, it's the stuff you take for acne. If you t eat too much vitamin A, you will die, and vitamin A is stored in the liver. And they knew not to eat seal liver too much, because otherwise they would get ill. When the British explorers went to the Arctic, they all started eating so much seal liver, and one of the doctors started recording the blood samples, because basically they were killing themselves, and they didn't know why, because they didn't know that they were overdosing on vitamin A. And vitamin A, I should say, if anyone else. We understand. We have. Uh, you never know. Um, and so, yeah. And so this doctor collected all of these blood samples so that they could take it back and work out what was happening. 
but because they were lost at sea and they were resorting to eating like the sled dogs as well. And then they got rescued and the people brought beer on and so they replaced all the blood samples in their freezer, I'm guessing not to the doctor's knowledge, with beer. So now we no longer have the record of what happens when you overdose so much on vitamin A to the point of near death because those records were just lost to for the beer. ocean for beer. Um, I, that's, that's a noble purpose. Yeah. It for but it, it, so if that, so people learn in that sense and so it's likely that in cannibalistic societies, maybe they had learned a similar thing with brains. Do you think that we, like that was a self-preservation method? Like we, it was advantageous for us not to eat ourselves evolutionary wise. And so we developed this like, don't eat yourself or you will kill yourself thing to protect ourselves. Quite possibly. A lot of reasons for disgust are that it, it, it causes us harm. So if we find something disgusting, typically it gives us disease. So vomit, feces, urine, um, gaping pussy wounds, things like that. These are all things that will harm us if we come into contact with them. Noxious smells, bitter chemicals in plants. So if we have a bitter food, bitter chemicals are often toxins and poisons. So things that we don't like typically are um, things that will harm us. So it's possible for cannabis. Also, it's possible that we are a very social species and a lot of our adaptations are to do with things that maintain social cohesion because we survive better and reproduce better as part of a social unit. And you can imagine that cannibalism kind of destroys that social bond. Yeah. Um, so, that, yeah, maybe. And that, that kind of tethered into another question I had, which is about like, um, like, well, one, I was like poop being so stinky and stuff is so that we don't eat it. But then why do dogs eat their own poop? Poop is poo is stinky because <laughs> there are many bacteria in it. Um uh, because it is the opera and there's lots of that uh, the um sulfur that is released, uh, sulfurous compounds smell awful, like rotten eggs, hydrogen sulfide, but there are many others as well, like thiols smell disgusting. So just the sheer compounds in them are very smelly compounds. The reason that they smell bad, because there's no chemical that is inherently a bad smelling chemical. We think it's bad because we've evolved to think that it smells bad. That is for self-preservation reasons. Why do dogs do it? Um, partly they have much stronger stomachs than us. <laughs> okay. um, and so they are less likely to get ill from eating poo. Um, <laughs> And so it, there isn't such an evolutionary pressure to avoid it. There's also going to be an aspect of curiosity and because there's a lot of opportunistic um, animals, so like crows, they will feed on anything. Like that's how dogs became to be humans pet animal because they were opportunistic <laughs> animals that <laughs> that eat shit <laughs> well, no, no, they used to be wild animals that used to skulk around human settlements and when we would throw out like bones and stuff that we weren't eating they were the ones brave enough to come into our settlements and take the food and then slowly they got uh, closer and closer and closer and then we started domesticating them as well but they started to domesticate themselves before we started to domesticate them so they're very opportunistic animals or at least they were they still um, are. Huh? They still are. That's the, okay. Uh, and uh, and so, yeah, it's likely that they're trying out new things as well. Um, so it, it's going to be a whole mixture of those reasons. Well, that's uh, a, it's a, a great question. I like where all of that went. So uh, I think we should probably wrap this up. So I just want to thank everyone for watching this episode of Spot of Science. And we'll see you guys next time. And as always, if you have any questions, send them to sciencespot at roosterteeth.com. <laughs>